So yeah, my name is Nils. It's a Swedish name because uh, my father's family is Nordic, but I'm from El Salvador. My pronouns are he, him, but Her Royal Highness also works. No. Uh, this Sunday was a special moon. In a lot of Buddhist countries, it's called uh, the Visakha Puja Day. And it's the commemoration of the birth, the enlightenment, and the death of Shakyamuni Buddha. Sakya is his caste, and Muni means somebody who's wise. So Sakyamuni is a title. Um, Gotama is sort of his last name, the clan name. And Siddhartha was his first name. Mythical figure, real figure, you know, there's whole controversy about what's real, what's not, and just with, with any figure. But I'll talk a little bit about that in my, in my Dharma talk about what Visakha Puja is. Um, okay, so going back to the full moon, you know, there's something interesting. The Buddha was born. He gave his first enlightenment speech. He got enlightened and uh, he also died under a tree. So environmentalists like to post this, that you know he was born under a tree, got enlightened under a tree. And the Bodhi tree is this, actually I've got some leaves that have been dipped in um, metals. It's very similar to the lotus flower in that the lotus flower grows in this mucky kind of terrain. And um, this little, tail here is what you can identify a Bodhi tree by when you're in India or in Thailand. And it's called Ficus religiosa in Latin. It kind of sounds like a drag queen. That could be my drag queen. Ficus religiosa. And um, I've noticed little Bodhi trees growing on it's like the, your gutter, is that what the, yeah, on the roof? And they grow everywhere, kind of like a weed. And when they become big, they're very beautiful. And the lotus flower just grows out of this mucky water, you know, so a symbol of enlightenment. For a, a number of years, like 300 years, there were no symbols of the Buddha. First, they started making these feet, like a little circle with feet. Um, and the uh, lotus and the uh, Bodhi tree also became symbols of the Buddha. So it was not until the Gandhara period, which was influenced by the Greeks, that you begin to see statues of the Buddha. And so this mythological figure that is above the gods, um, you know, gets mixed with whatever tradition came in. There are some people who think that some religions are superstitious and that Buddhism is not. Well, what box are you putting Buddhism in that you would make such a statement, right? Like people write a book like Buddhism without beliefs or, um, you know, when Spirit Rock started or other places, there wasn't a lot of emphasis on ritual or tradition or chanting. It was all kind of like meditating and, and people are softening with that. And um, as you look at the, I give a whole talk on the life of the Buddha and the ways that I reflect on it, on what does this story have to teach me? How is it relevant? And um, the scriptures are a good pointing and it, they also have their limitations. So 50% of the world's lived experience or more has been the experience who are not cisgender males. Yet, how, you know, do we know the history of women? There's so much erasure. Right? Um, the Buddha was a person of color, <laughs> right? And now people want to become millionaires selling his teachings. I came across the fact that Eckhart Tolle is worth $70 million. And people were like, he shouldn't have all those millions. He should donate it. If he's enlightened, you know, he's an author. He shouldn't have 70 million. And just by 
curiosity, I asked Alexa, and sometimes Alexa knows things and sometimes she doesn't, but I'm like, how much money does uh, this guy have? So Deepak Chopra has $150 million in the bank. <laughs> and the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who introduced meditation to the Beatles and to, there hasn't been anyone in the history of modern world where uh, meditation has been introduced as much as transcendental meditation, TM. And he died being worth $1 billion. And uh, we live in a materialistic society where now you're coming with capitalism and Buddhism. So wherever Buddhism comes in, you know, it goes to Tibet, it becomes like that. It goes to China, it becomes like this. It comes to San Francisco, it becomes like this, right? It mixes with psychotherapy, it mixes with capitalism. And we have to be aware of what it does when it mixes with us. Do we want it to be a relaxation exercise? Do we want it to be the answer for everything? And in Visakha Puja, you take a time and say, okay, so Buddha is born. What is that story? You know, there's a woman who's holding onto a tree and there was a dream and a white elephant. And why is it that the birth of a special person has to be so special? For example, the virgin birth. You know, why is it that the Egyptians were interested in a virgin birth? So Isis is this virgin goddess. And just recently, I was talking about this this week at another Sangha that I, how I was thinking, you know, a lot of women have this superpower and some men where you can give birth. You know, as a cis male, I cannot have like, and I'm like, what, what would that be like? It's like having a little alien in there, you know? And like, oh, a sudden it comes out. But a virgin mother doesn't need a man. It's just a woman and has the superpower and gives birth. And then that gets all twisted into virginity being some kind of virtue that you have to protect. And yet, again, the ratio of women, you know, the ratio of queer people. When I was a monk and I used to talk, there was only two other gay monks. Theravada Buddhism doesn't attract a lot of gay people. It's not very glamorous. We wouldn't have cute hats or nice robes. You know, it's all kind of ugly and boring <laughs> in many ways. But we used to talk about Ananda, the cousin and the attendant of the Buddha. And it was like, mm, Ananda sounds like a sister. He's, he's a bit gay, you know? He's the one who petitions for nuns to join the order. He's the one who's very sensitive. He's the one who, when the Buddha dies, they find him in a corner and he's just crying, you know, and they're like, Ananda, get over it. And he's like, no, the Buddha just died, you know, it's like a sensitive fellow. And, and so the birth of, you know, what is the story of our birth? How much do we know? Is it an adoption? Was it a happy birth? And that's a past life. You know, people don't understand past lives, but you don't have to worry about life and death. Just like that one day old, if they put 20 babies and they put you there, would you be able to know which one is you? I wouldn't. Is that child dead? Because that one day old baby doesn't have the same thoughts as you. It doesn't have the same body. It doesn't have the same emotions. So the story of my birth is that my mother was dancing. My Aunt Hilda got married on the 4th of January on a Sunday. And everybody was dancing at the wedding party. And then my mom is like, ah, I'm in labor. So she goes to the hospital and everybody wearing their regalia from the wedding shows up at the hospital. I'm born at five in the morning because my mom was dancing. So I'm like, oh, that was a happy birth. You know? Do you know your birth story? You know, ask around if you have a chance. Maybe, maybe that's a possibility. That you might have a relative who knows. And then what is your enlightenment story? Every little enlightenment is the point where something heals. You know, every time that you notice the present moment, maybe it hasn't happened in this lifetime yet, 
But when he does, all religions start to make sense. There is a saying in, in uh, Christianity, the language of God is silence. Everything else is a poor translation. Actually, I shouldn't say Christianity. Maybe a lot of people say that. The language of God is silence. Everything else is a poor translation. God is love. Made absolutely no sense to him. And in English, of course, it's very complicated because love, you can love gelato, you can love your lover, you can love your grandma, you can love Bridgerton. You know what I mean? Like you can just love all this stuff. In Spanish, we have a lot of words for love. You know? Te adoro, te quiero, te amo. You wouldn't say to your grandma, I love you the way that you love ice cream or the way that you love your lover sometimes, right? And so God is love is the experience of that which is not able to be explained with words. And um, it's, it's a moment of grace, you know, it's a moment of um, it's like pure satisfaction. People will talk about awareness, but it's like a moment where you are experiencing life. You're not asking anything. And it's not mindfulness with little m, which is just, it sometimes is defined as not doing a whole bunch of stuff. You're not multitasking. So paying attention and being concentrated is a kind of mindfulness. And then there's the other one where it's just awake, you're just awake. It's uh, Ajahn Chah, my teacher's teacher used to say, it's like a, a forest pool. It's moving, but it's very still. So the water is in a stream and that the mind can be like that. So what is your enlightenment story? At what points have you, you know, why did you come here tonight? Well, all the things that you could have been doing, here you are. You know, what is your meditation practice? What is your spiritual practice? And you have to take some time once in a while to reflect and say, what am I doing? What have I gained? Am I, am I, am I loosening things up? Because that's the wisdom part, you know. And um, if you take anything that you want to do, whether it's your career or, you know, you can do the work and then sometimes things happen. Like, I like to say forgiveness is something that happens. It's not something that is created. And then the death of the Buddha. Do you think about your mortality? I don't know a lot of, I don't know a lot of you but I know 100% that you're gonna die. This I know about you. And in Western capitalist society, like death is a failure, it's some kind of failure. You know, doctors used to be, especially 20 years ago or more. It's like if a patient died, somehow that was really bad. And uh, death is just this normal thing. Grieving is another story. There's nothing like grief to pull you down to the earth. Like when you are truly grieving, um, you know, there are times that there's absolutely nothing that can, anyone can say, anything that you can do. The only thing is patient endurance. Grieving is, it's one of the definitions of dukkha. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are dukkha, is one of the phrases. Sorrow, sadness, lamentation is when you verbalize. Pain and grief and despair. It's just the nature of being human. And all the little deaths that we can have. You know, getting older, so that young person died. You know, being attractive. 
like my my supposedly cute years in the twenties when I was in my twenties. That's when I shaved my head and I wore that robe that is described in one of the scriptures as the color of baby diarrhea. I'm like, well, that's really pleasant color. What pantom is that? You take the kankanu tree, you cut it up, you boil it, and then you put the stuff in there. And of course, you know, in Tibet, they don't have that tree. That's a tropical tree. So they end up with this gorgeous little, you know, maroon. You go to Japan, they're not tropical, so they end up with these beautiful colors. And then in Thailand, I wore like yucky color. Anyway. <laughs> so that's a, that's a day when, when we commemorate the birth, the enlightenment, and the death of the Buddha. And his statement was, you can be enlightened. The third noble truth. It is your birthright. And the Buddha did not, did not invade, invent enlightenment. I get impatient sometimes with like, in Western thought they say this, and in Eastern thought they say that. The, we, the West and the East. I'm like, where is Sub-Saharan Africa? Where are the people and the Lenka people of El Salvador? Where are the Aboriginal people of Australia? Are they Eastern or Western? Like the arrogance to divide the world into East and West as if enlightenment never happened in Africa, as if enlightenment never happened in the Americas. Of course it happened. 600 years of my life of the libraries in El Salvador were burned by the Spanish. They were written in deer skin. We still have the scriptures from India because the British would steal stuff, but they wouldn't destroy it. And you can reach enlightenment if you were to think of a, of, a, of a linear term in different ways. The jhanas, the seven um, steps of meditation, right samadhi, sama samadhi. That is described exactly in the same order by St. Teresa of Avila, a Spanish nun. It is described in the same way in the Hindu scriptures because we only have one nervous system. The nervous system of somebody in Northern India is not different from somebody who's Arab or somebody who's Christian or somebody, you know. People who practice are rare. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, out of 1,000 people, one follows me. And out of 1,000 followers, one truly knows me. And that used to depress me. I'm like, whoa, that's really rare. But actually, you know, go to a stadium during a game and ask how many of those people have a religious practice. And take all the people that have a religious practice and how many of them have a sincere practice and have a discipline, a discipleship, you know, where they're like, yeah, I want to know truth. As opposed to having religion as a hobby or having religion as something that's gonna make you better. That, you know, being a Muslim, like one who surrenders, when you've got, when you have surrendered and you're truly Muslim, when you have crucified yourself and like a phoenix, you rise up. When you have known dukkha and then the end of dukkha, when this is experienced, it is a rare occurrence. And at one point, do we say, am I interested? in being on this path, it takes a lot of courage because you're inviting your karma to ripen, you're inviting your trauma to be processed, you're inviting all of these things that are not that easy. But what else are we gonna live for? Is to get everything you want? To manifest all the nice things? I've had a life filled with blessings, just manifesting this and that, and then what? 
So you made, you made a list of 12 things and you got all 12 things. Then you make a list of 13 new things. So you have the perfect partner, the perfect house. You have idealism while living in a world that has climate crisis, political stuff. So it's, it's, uh, it's interesting work uh, to actually say, I, I want to look at my birth. I want to look at my life. I want to look at my death.